Hi everybody. So today I want to talk to you about the energy of damped harmonic oscillators and also quality factors. So in a previous lecture we solved for the damped harmonic oscillator. Okay? So the damped harmonic oscillator, the only one that can be explicitly solved, is the one where the friction is due to viscous friction. So that's the minus um, CV term. Okay, so we have a damped harmonic oscillator. Okay, the solution to that one is that the position with respect to time is equal to the um, initial amplitude A times e to the minus gamma t over 2 times the cosine of omega t plus phi. Now here, gamma is equal to C over M, where C is the damping coefficient and M is the mass. And omega is the frequency of the damped oscillations. Now that's different from the natural frequency omega naught for an undamped oscillator. Remember that omega naught is equal to the square root of K over M. And so when you start to damp that motion, the frequency is going to shift some. And how much it shifts is proportional to the amount of damping that you have. So omega, now, in the presence of damping, is equal to the square root of omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4. Okay? Alright, so we've got the position as a function of time. We also, in order to fully describe the energy of this mass on a spring, need to give the um, velocity of the particle. So the velocity is the time derivative of the position, dx dt. Now, if I take the derivative of this expression that I have up here, a e to the minus gamma t over 2 cosine omega t plus v, then what I end up with is minus gamma over 2 times a e to the minus gamma over 2 cosine omega t plus v minus omega a e to the minus gamma over 2 sine of omega t plus v. Okay? So you have these two functions of time multiplying times one another, and so you end up with two terms in your velocity instead of just one from the position. All right? So that's what we have for the position of the velocity. Now remember, this is for a horizontal, one-dimensional damped harmonic oscillator. All right, so this is just to describe that. Okay, now that we have uh, functions for the position and the velocity, we can calculate the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, and the potential energy, one half kx squared. And of course, the sum of those two quantities, k plus u, is the total mechanical energy of the system. All right, now, unlike the uh, undamped harmonic oscillator with no friction, this energy is not constant, but is going to decay with time. So in order to show you the function of how the energy decays with time, I need to go through a little bit of a derivation here. So bear with me. We're about to go through some tricky, tedious math. All right. So let's solve for u. u is equal to 1 half kx squared. So it's 1 half times k the spring constant times that function that we had for x of t squared. So when I square that function, I end up with u is equal to 1 half k a squared e to the minus gamma t cosine squared of omega t plus v. Okay? Now it's e to the minus gamma t because when you square e to the minus gamma t over 2, then you get e to the minus gamma t. Okay, the over 2 cancels out when you square it because you're multiplying the 2 in the power. All right, now my k is 1 half mv squared. All right, so when I carry out the square of that rather complicated formula that we have for v, here's what I end up with 1 half m a squared times e to the minus gamma t, and now times the quantity inside the square brackets here which is gamma over 2 squared times cosine squared, omega t plus v, plus omega squared times the sine squared of omega t plus v, plus the cross term, omega times gamma times the cosine times the sine. All right? So all that multiplies 1 half m a squared e to the minus gamma t. Now what I've got to do to get the total mechanical energy for the system is to sum k plus u. Okay? So when I do that, I'm just going to here, in this third line of uh, equations, write out the sum of u plus k. So I have 1 half ka squared e to the minus gamma t times the cosine squared plus 1 half ma squared e to the minus gamma t times quantity k 
gamma over 2 quantity squared times cosine squared plus omega squared times the sine squared plus omega gamma times cosine times sine. Okay? So that's what I get. Now, what I've done on these slides is to try and highlight different things that I'm going to change from one line to the next to move through my derivation. So I'd like to show you here, I've highlighted in white the uh, omega squared that's multiplying the sine squared term. Okay? Now remember that this is the frequency of damped oscillations. So if I wanted to write that out in terms of other constituents, omega squared is omega naught squared minus gamma over 2 quantity squared. Okay? So that's all I've done from this line to the next. I've broken that out. Now, why have I done that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start combining terms to try and simplify things. Okay? So here I go. The first thing I want to show you is that I've got here on the top line stuff highlighted in white. Okay? So one of the things that I've highlighted in white is 1 half Ka squared e to the minus gamma t times the cosine squared. Okay? The other thing is this term 1 half m a squared e to the minus gamma t times omega naught squared times sine squared. Okay, so that's all the stuff that's going to multiply together there in white that makes one term. All right. Now, omega naught is the natural frequency of oscillation. Omega naught is equal to the square root of k over m, or omega naught squared is equal to k over m. So that means that if I multiply m times omega naught squared, I get k. Okay? So this 1 half m omega naught squared a squared e to the minus gamma t sine squared, right, can pair up with this 1 half k a squared e to the minus gamma t cosine squared because k is equal to m omega squared. And then I end up with 1 half k a squared e to the minus gamma t times cosine squared plus sine squared, which is 1. Okay? So that means that all of these terms in white combine together to be 1 half a squared e to the minus gamma t times k, which I've simplified here in this next line. Okay? So if you need to at any time, make sure to pause the video and go back and see if you can recreate my math. Okay? All right. The next simplification that I'm going to do is to show you how to combine these two terms, the stuff I've highlighted in yellow. So everything inside these square brackets multiplies the 1 half a squared e to the minus gamma t. So I'm not going to keep repeating that. But now I'm just looking inside the square brackets. Okay? What I've done is I've gone ahead and on the rest of these terms that were inside these square brackets, I moved the m inside and multiplied it times every term. So now I have m gamma over 2 squared times the cosine squared minus m gamma over 2 squared times the sine squared. Okay. Well, I can use a trig identity here. Cosine squared of some angle minus sine squared of that si same angle gives you cosine of 2 times that angle. Here I've called the angle B, but it doesn't really matter what you call it. This is the trig identity. So here, I'm going to let my angle be this omega t plus b. All right? And so I can combine these two m gamma over 2 squared terms together times cosine squared minus sine squared and get it to be m gamma over 2 squared times cosine of 2 omega t plus b. So I've simplified these two terms into one term. Okay, now finally, looking here, I have omega gamma cosine times the sine. And I've highlighted that in orange. Okay? Now it turns out that cosine of an angle times the sine of an angle is equal to 1 half times the sine of 2 times that angle. So I can make this at least a little shorter, right? <laughs> and say that cosine times the sine um, is equal to 1 half times 2 the sine, which I've done here on this next line. Okay? Whoops, I forgot to highlight my thing there in orange, which I'll do. Okay? All right, so it's not a lovely expression to be sure, but it is a shorter expression now that we have for the total energy of the system. We have 1 half a squared e to the minus gamma t, gamma t times quantity k plus m gamma over 2 quantity squared cosine of 2 omega t plus b plus 1 half um, m omega gamma 
just this being in there, m omega gamma times the sine of 2 times omega t plus v. Okay? All right. Now, if the damping is small, if gamma is not a very big number, then k will be a lot bigger than either of these two terms that I have here in yellow or orange. Okay? And then we can approximate the whole thing as an exponential decay. And e would be proportional to 1 half k a squared e to the minus gamma t. And we can call 1 half k a squared the initial energy of the system, right? And we'll call that e naught. And so our energy would experience an exponential decay from its initial value e naught times e to the minus gamma t. This is approximate. Of course, these cosines and sine terms in here are going to cause some oscillations about that exponential decay. Let me show you what I mean. What I've done on this next slide is I've taken this energy expression that I have here with no approximations and I've plugged into it for a specific oscillator because I wanted to show you what the energy function would decay with time would look like. So here it is. I modeled a system that has a spring constant of 10 newtons per meter, a mass of 60 grams, a damping coefficient of 0.1, and an amplitude of square root of 2. I just did that so that when I squared it and I had the 1 half out front, I could just multiply by 1, just for ease of use. So these numbers gave me gamma is equal to 1.66666. Omega naught, the natural frequency, would be 12.91 radians per second. And then my damped frequency of oscillation would be really close to that at 12.88 radians per second. So you can see that with light damping, you don't get a huge shift in between your natural frequency and the frequency that you actually see. Now, using the idea that t is equal to 2 pi over omega, I see that I have a period of about 0.5 seconds. So I decided to take it out to four full periods of oscillation. So I plotted out what was going to happen in Excel for my function for two seconds, which is about four full periods. All right, so this is what it looks like. You can see that it's definitely an exponential decay, but on top of that exponential decay, you see those cosine and sine wiggly terms, which give it a little bit of features. Now remember, we already modeled a damped harmonic oscillator um, in vPython, okay, in a previous lecture. Do you remember what that looked like? So here's a picture of that damped harmonic oscillator from the code. So from a previous um, lecture, you can go back and rerun that code if you want to. The total mechanical energy is the green curve pictured here. The blue and the yellow are the um, potential and kinetic energies, respectively. But the green curve is the total mechanical energy decay. And notice that we said that you could see that there was some time dependence there. And that when the kinetic energy was, um, I'm sorry, when the potential energy was maximized and the kinetic energy was zero, you saw that plateau in the energy because the energy dissipation is going to be largest when the velocity is largest because E is equal, uh, the frictional force is minus CV. So the frictional force is large when the velocity is large, which means that when the velocity is zero, right, at the turning points, then you'll see that plateau in the energy, right? So that's what the features looked like. And you can see we have exactly those same kinds of features, right? on our other little curve. Now these don't have the same spring constants or damping coefficients from the previous lecture, okay? But you can see that the structure of the uh, energy is the same, all right? So that's nice. We were able to model something, right, before we really did the analytical solution for it. So that's kind of cool. All right, now one way that physicists have a tendency to quantify the damping or energy loss in an oscillator is using something called a Q factor or a quality factor. So the quality factor is defined as the average energy stored in an oscillator divided by the average energy dissipated in that oscillator during one radian of motion. Mathematically, that could be written as the absolute value of the average energy divided by the change in energy delta E. Now, if you use that expression that we developed for light damping, right, E naught, E to the minus gamma T, in other words, for light damping, that change in energy delta E would be dE dt times delta T. So that would be the time derivative of E naught E to the minus gamma T times delta T. The time derivative of that would be minus gamma times E naught E to the minus gamma T times delta T. All right, now for one radian of motion, we would have one radian is equal to 
omega times the change in time. So solving, we could say that the change in time delta t was 1 over omega. Now if you plug that in for your delta t, then the expression that you get for the delta e is delta e is equal to minus gamma over omega times e naught e to the minus gamma t. Let's plug that in to our expression for the quality factor. The quality factor is equal to the absolute value of e naught e to the minus gamma t divided by minus gamma over omega e naught e to the minus gamma t. So when you divide that out, you end up with, when you take the absolute value, omega over gamma. So you can express the quality factor as a simple ratio of the angular frequency omega to the damping coefficient gamma, which is C over M. So heavily damped oscillators are going to have a low quality factor, right? And lightly damped oscillators have a high quality factor, okay? Now you might be asking yourself, she used that expression e naught to the e naught times e to the minus gamma t to model that motion. How good of an approximation is that anyway, really? Right? I mean, if you have a lightly damped oscillator, what does that even mean and how close do they get together? So to solve that, within Excel, what I did was I plotted the approximation, right, e naught e to the minus gamma t in the red curve and I laid that atop the full energy expression that we derived with the cosine and the sine wiggles in it, okay? I plotted those two things over top of one another. And you can see that for this lightly damped oscillator, it's actually a pretty good approximation of the energy decay, okay? So I think you can go forward feeling confident that as long as the damping is light, then this expression will work very well and model uh, the full expression, okay? All right, um, thanks for your time. I'll do some example problems in another lecture, um, but I wanted to get into the theory in this one. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you in class.